Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 29 of the Camino Voice. On this episode, I speak to one of the fourth generation owners of Christofferson Farm. Please welcome Chris Christofferson. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Camino Voice podcast, where I interview folks around Camino Island and beyond. If you want to stay up to date on events, businesses, and even hear a little history of this area, subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. On this episode, I got to speak to Chris Christofferson from Christofferson Farm, and it was a, uh, a really interesting conversation. One, because their farm has been here uh, since the 1920s, I believe. Uh, that's when the land was like purchased. And he's been coming up here since he was a little kid. So I got a little glimpse of what Kamena was like way back when, um, as well as what the original land was that they purchased and um, the whole evolution of how Christofferson Farm has become what it is today versus what it has been in the past. And uh, also, I got to dive into the, the history of Chris and where he started with his career and how he's gotten to where he is now. And uh, what he sees as the future of Christofferson Farm. So I really enjoyed my conversation with him, and I hope you will too. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Chris Christofferson. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Kamena Voice. Today I'm here with a fourth generation owner of uh, Christofferson Farm. Uh, please welcome Chris Christofferson. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Brandon. I'm glad to be here. So before we get started on everything, tell us a little bit about Chris. Well, uh, I am one of five siblings in my family and I'm right in the middle amongst four sisters and <clears throat> I uh, split my time a little bit between Seattle and Camano Island spending more time on Camano than in Seattle and uh, as you know I hang out over there at Christofferson Farm a lot and uh, I love it it's a great thing very cool yeah, I uh, up until just now, I didn't actually realize that you mostly or you live in technically in Seattle. I just figured you lived up here. That's right. It uh, I do spend more time staying up here than I do in Seattle, and my wife and I look forward to building at some point in the not too distant future up here. Uh, but right now, I do split my time. Okay, nice. <clears throat> so I want to go back um, quite a ways now. Um, what brought the Christoffersons to Camino Island, and when was that? You know, it's kind of an interesting story, Brandon, because uh, my great-grandfather, Alfred, uh, was sort of a dairying pioneer in the Pacific Northwest. Pacific Northwest. He established a dairy in Seattle, Christofferson Dairy, right around the turn of the century, 1900. And <clears throat> he brought uh, pasteurization, actually, to the Pacific Northwest uh, as a new thing. And... Uh, brought a cream top bottle, which is a special type of bottle which allowed you to easily pour the cream off that would separate from the milk. And this was before the days of milk being what they called homogenized. Uh, now all the milk you buy is that way unless you buy raw milk. <clears throat> At any rate, he'd established the successful dairy in Seattle. It was a small but growing operation. And he had two sons and a daughter. And his uh, eldest son, also named Alfred, was uh, already involved with the dairy and interested in being involved as a career as well. The second son, however, was much more interested in farming. And uh, our great-grandfather must have been a man of some means because he was able to buy this very large piece of property up here on the island and uh, begin clearing a little bit of the land and also building the dairy and hay barns. And according to letters that I exchanged with my uh, great aunt, who was the third of the children in that family, uh, it was uh, aimed at sort of bringing that second son into the dairy business through dairy farming, okay. or at least uh, as an adjunct <clears throat> to the dairy business. Uh, those plans were really upset, however, because <clears throat> my great grandfather purchased that farm, which way back then was much larger, included all of Camelock, the golf course, all the way down to Triangle Cove. Wow. Yeah, uh, huge. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> he bought that in 1912, 
and then proceeded, as I said, to uh, clear some of the land. Uh, a lot of it had already been cleared, but uh, <clears throat> and then to build the barns. And the barns were completed in 1914, but that same year he passed away of oh. uh, what's called pernicious anemia. It's not a disease I tend to hear about now, so I don't know if vitamin knowledge or something like that might have eliminated it. At any rate, uh, the second, uh, my grandfather was the second son, and the eldest son was already involved with the dairy, but he was fighting in World War I and wound up being killed in action. Wow. So that left my then 23-year-old grandfather, who was the one interested in farming, to manage everything. And <clears throat> because the dairy was getting to be a going concern, that really consumed a great deal of his effort. And uh, it made it so that his farming ambitions sort of had to take a back seat while he tended to the details of the dairy business. Yeah. Uh, very interesting, however. We have uh, a lot of correspondence. Uh, my family, were they were good record keepers. And uh, we have letters from my great-grandmother to my grandfather, and she was, you know, even back in the day, here was a woman who was sharp in there pitching. He had to go address, address a dairyman's conference at age 23. And she said, you need to talk to this person, this person, and this person. So she already knew who the hitters were. <laughs> and when it came to his remarks before the group, she said, above all, be brief. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she was in there pitching. Uh, it, really kind of cool. Yeah. So uh, as mentioned, that really sort of pulled my grandfather away from his uh, stated love of farming. And the the place became, rather than a real thriving business entity, more of a family retreat for many, many years. Okay. Uh, with some uh, modest farming activity done, uh, beef cattle and the like, uh, through a manager, uh, another family that was on Camino for many years, the Rubles, Fred and Vesta Rubel, stayed in the cottage on the property and they sort of managed the land uh for my granddad okay and during that time did you guys still have the dairy operation down in seattle well that was that was uh a lot of those years were before my time okay and the uh, christopherson dairy continued i believe until uh maybe around 1951 or something and okay. it was then sold to uh meadowsweet really okay yep yeah. And uh, then not too many years later to Foremost. Got it. Okay. Wow. Okay, so you guys, <laughs> neat seeing the, all the history woven together. And, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so then, um, uh, okay, so then you guys got here. Um, what was, so how did that land eventually get split up? Like, when was that, and how did that kind of transpire, as far as you know? Well, uh, this is interesting, and I believe enough time has passed that this is reasonable information to share. My grandfather uh, divorced my grandmother, and he already sort of had established a relationship with his secretary. And uh, a little scandalous uh, in <laughs> retrospect, but he wound up marrying the secretary very shortly after his uh, divorce was final. And she was a very conservative woman and felt like uh, the, the debt associated with the ramping up the dairy business, she was very uh, against debt in general. Yeah. And I think that uh, the sale of about 500 acres for the Camelot development uh, was part of that thinking that liquidating that property would allow for the elimination of all business-related debt. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> so that was a part of it. But also there have been successive generations of the family. And so pieces have gone to other family members also. Mm -hmm. So the part that we now manage, uh, originally it had been 1,200 acres. What we now manage is 231. Okay. And uh, then uh, relatives do possess a little bit of adjacent property. Yeah. Wow, 1,200 acres. That's yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so then at what age um, did your parents, did they live, where did were they at, like, once they got married, and where were they? Were they here on the island? Were they elsewhere? Well, my dad uh, 
worked for Christofferson Dairy in Seattle. Okay. And was a manager down there. And he continued that as the business was sold to Meadowsweet and then to Foremost also. So the dairy business was my dad's career. And so he stayed in Seattle. But the uh, farm up here on Kameno was always a treasured family place. And we would be up here many, many weekends, almost every weekend in the summer and uh, additional weekends during the winter as well. Okay. And uh, so it was more of a family retreat or getaway yeah. uh, than anything. Although my dad over time came to enjoy doing work on the farm, he started raising beef cattle himself. Uh, I can remember some of my earliest involvement was with fencing and also uh, field prep for planting, uh, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So what was... <clears throat> what year is that, that you guys are starting to come up here? And- oh, uh, from my earliest childhood, uh, that was one of my fondest memories, actually, was getting just old enough that my parents would turn me loose on my own <laughs> to go up into the woods and just roam around and discover the forest. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And so that happened probably when I was in my, you know, probably eight or nine, something like that. And uh, so... As long as I can remember, we have always been coming up here. Okay. Yeah. So what was Kameno like back then? What do you, what do you remember? Very different. Uh, <laughs> I can say that when I was, even up until the point of my young adulthood, we could, I could be standing on our property and not see uh, any houses in any direction looking from the farm. Now, it's, it's much different. Uh, there's been a lot of development on the island. Uh, I can remember a time when the, uh, my two, my sisters and I were walking in the woods and, uh, on our way back, it was getting late in the afternoon. My eldest sister wanted to go a different way down. And the, the other two of us thought, Ooh, this is not a good idea, <laughs> but she was determined and she did it and she did get lost. Okay. And, uh, I can remember the reason I'm bringing this up, Brandon, is because, uh, Cross Island Road was brand new then. Wow, and it okay. Was, it was a gravel road at that point. And the wind was howling, and I, we were in the car with my parents driving every couple <laughs> hundred feet along Cross Island, getting out and yelling for my sister. Turns out she were uh, wound up coming out down near the gravel pit, uh, which is where, like, the county offices are down there, sort of near the refuse station. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, Hitched a ride with some people who were a little inebriated, so it was a little bit of a harrowing experience for oh, her. Oh, my word. But <laughs> everyone wound up safe and sound after all of it. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, were there, what were kind of the main, did you, you still have the main road going down, like 532, or? Oh, yeah, it was, that was all here, and even uh, when I first started coming up here, uh, even after I was married and in my early 20s, uh, and driving up here, I could get on the West Seattle Freeway down in town. Okay. And the light from 35th to the West Seattle Freeway was the last traffic control I would encounter uh, coming up to the farm except for the stop sign at the foot of uh, the exit from I-5. Wow. There were no lights, and now I think there are 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I hit every one of them. Yep, yep. So it was, uh, it was a lot different, but even that was... Uh, different from my childhood because when I came up in my childhood there was no I-5 up here it was just old 99 it took two hours to get from Seattle up to here wow yeah yeah that's quite the drive yeah no kidding are we there yet (laughs) (laughs) yeah what was Stanwood like driving through that uh you know Stanwood has changed some uh 532 as it is currently configured I think is new compared to my childhood because I think we drove right through uh, older Stanwood okay. back then, uh, <clears throat> would come down uh, right there, uh, yeah, right through the center Straight of town. Through, yeah. yeah. And uh, so it was smaller, and, you know, there were no supermarkets or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. And when I was a child, I can remember, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it was Hopkins's that had the Camino Plaza market, which was just a very small market where the IGA and all that is now. Yeah. And it was just a, I think it was a small two-aisle store about the size 
of Huntington's. Okay. And uh, but they made a good milkshake. I do remember that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, because I when we had moved up here, they were starting. I'm trying to think when they completed. It. I think in '96. I want to say something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but they were doing construction on that when we had like it wasn't the what it is now yeah. when we first moved up here. Sure. And they were starting construction, so they had yeah. already wiped any sort of old stuff out. Yeah. Sure. Um yeah, the only store I really remember was the little store over the bay. If you go on West Camano. Uh, okay. It's like right looking over Athlati Bay. Yeah. Um that was a store I used to go to all the time, which no longer is there. <laughs> oh, there was that little store in Atzalati was great. Uh when my mom got fed up of having all of us kids around her ankles, my dad would take us up to the store at Utsalati because they had uh, these white wood bins full of penny candy. Yep. And, you know, for 20 cents, you could get a handful of candy, and uh, we thought that was great fun, and it gave my mom a little break. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, there probably wasn't much else to do besides that and explore. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and we were uh, cautioned against running around in the fields, even though we really liked doing so. The, the grass, or in some cases, oats, was tall, and so it was sort of like you could have these trails through the fields, but we were knocking down crops, and uh, <laughs> and so uh, my dad sort of thought that was a bit of a nuisance. Yeah, so during this time, was there one of your family members that was taking care, in, taking care of the farm and everything? Well, my grandfather was... Uh, still alive and he would be up here quite a bit and uh, as mentioned before he had this manager Fred Rubel who lived on the property uh, for a lot of those years but when we uh, when my parents and uh, their kids started wanting to come up I think then uh, the Rubels were still involved but not living on the property okay yeah and uh, so my grandfather would have them do a number of things he would do a few things himself and uh, <clears throat> uh, also the Rubel's son, Fritz, uh, <clears throat> they would contract with him to maintain perimeters and that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then growing up, you were coming up here, <clears throat> but living in Seattle. Correct. Um, then you, what happened like through high school, getting out of high school? What, what was your kind of decisions there? Well, uh when I got out of high school, I went to college back east, uh, and it uh, because the dairy business had really changed a lot in Seattle. Uh, when I was a kid, it was all home delivery, and uh, when I was in high school, <clears throat> junior high and high school, it was transitioning into really getting your milk at the supermarket. Okay. And, uh, by then, the company was foremost that my dad was working for, and they were a little slow to pick up on that trend. And uh, because of it, business was truly challenging, and it, uh, it sort of changed my dad's uh, compensation from being what had been pretty good to being a lot more modest. And we had uh, five kids in our family and a big house in Seattle. And so uh, going to a private school back east was... Uh, a stretch yeah and, and so in my summers I had to make money and I uh, in high school I started working up in Alaska in a salmon cannery to earn money for college okay and so uh, I was sort of busy most of the time and then uh, when I went off to school then that was uh, a different deal and I would still work in Alaska in the summer to keep the money flowing in for school yeah yeah so what what made you decide on going back east for school well uh, you know, the University of Washington is a good school, uh, and it's it's become better over time, for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, back, thankfully, when I was in the point at the point where I would apply, <clears throat> it was sort of a fallback school. If you okay. had, if you were a Washington resident and had better than a C average, you could kind of get in. Okay. Uh, now it's really demanding to yeah. get in, and I'm yeah. thankful my kids made it because it was <laughs> it wasn't a sure thing by any stretch. But I did want to attend a school in a different part of the country so I could see something different. Yeah. And so Cornell really filled, uh, fit the bill there, and I, I did have a wonderful time. Uh, beautiful campus, uh, great education, at least in theory. And, uh, and it really did allow me to see the eastern seaboard some. I was on the crew team, so that allowed me to travel a little bit. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, though, Brandon, one of the, 
key takeaways from all of that. I really enjoyed my time back there, but it it so made me realize how wonderful the Pacific Northwest is. I mean, and I couldn't get over it. You know, they would point to this <coughs> bump on the <laughs> land and call it a mountain. I was traveling with classmates to uh, one of their houses uh, in New York for Thanksgiving because I really couldn't afford the trip home. And uh, they were talking about this mountain over there, and I said, what mountain? And <laughs> it was, we, I don't even know that we would out here typically glorify that as a foothill. <laughs> and uh, so it was a real wake-up call for me about, you know, we are lucky to have all the natural beauty, the rugged mountains, the whole deal, the yeah. islands, the water. It's really terrific yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was something when we went over to Charleston, it was, uh, we, we did an eight-month stint over there. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it was something that we were like, over there, they, there was flat, like you went up on a bridge that like was a little bit above sea level yeah. and you could just see as far, like oh, yeah. there was nothing. And it was so, um, weird almost mm -hmm. cause you're almost like lose your sense of where you are just cause there's no landmark or nothing. That's right. I, when I came back from my freshman year at college, it was, uh, dramatic to get to, uh, like Iowa and those states and it was like someone with a giant ruler scraped that land perfectly flat. Yeah. I mean, truly flat. Uh, you could you could see sort of arbitrarily far, depending on air quality, and you would just look down the road and you would see to the next overpass that was in front of you, basically. Yeah, yeah. no, it's it's weird. Um, and that was kind of our, our thing, too, when we came back here. Like, mm -hmm. the, the beauty that we get to go and see on a regular basis is mm -hmm. just... Um, it's amazing. So yes. Um, so <clears throat> real quick, I wanted to touch on. So you said you mentioned that you went to Cornell University. Mm -hmm. What kind of drove you towards that versus any of the other ones? Uh, a couple things. One, I was wanting to uh, study mechanical engineering, and two, they let me in. <laughs> I applied to a collection of schools, uh, most of which I would have to say, in retrospect, were uh, pretty nervy for me to think I had a chance at getting in. But <laughs> Cornell did let me in. So. Uh, that was good, and it was uh, it was great. Yeah. Yep. So then, <clears throat> we actually have similar backgrounds in that. I I did mechanical engineering as okay. well. Okay. Yeah. Um, what kind of what made you go in that direction? Well, uh, some wrongheadedness, I would say, just because I had this idea that engineers get to really do front end design work, uh, conceptual design work, oh, which really okay. did interest me. Yeah. And there may be a handful of engineers that get to do that, <clears throat> but. The vast majority of engineering is taking a concept and trying to make all the numbers line up so it's doable. Yes. And for me, that was less, uh, I sort of came to learn over the time of my education and shortly thereafter that mechanical engineering, uh, while a very useful thing to have studied for the problem solving yeah. rigor that you learn, yeah. uh, was not really going to be my long term <clears throat> career. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was something. It was when I was deciding with mechanical, mechanical engineering is that even if I never used a degree again, mm -hmm. the education you get in problem solving and critical thinking and all of that right. is something you'll use in any part of life. So. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So then once you graduated, did you actually enter the engineering field at all or what'd you do? My first job uh, was with Boeing as what they call a manufacturing engineer and uh, that was on the uh, aerospace side, so it was military hardware. Uh, okay. Basically taking uh, engineering drawings, creating process planning for uh, the manufacture of all the components that go into an assembly, and then sort yeah. of trying to oversee their uh, their process through manufacturing. Yeah. So then how long were you working there? Three years. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Cool. So then after three years, what kind of, what happened that kind of let you leave there? Uh, well, it, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I very much, I value every step I've taken, uh, so far in life, even the ones that were challenging, but the time at Boeing was very good in one sense in that I learned, uh, cause we'd go to meetings and discuss, uh, status on all this stuff. And I learned a little bit about project scheduling and yeah. that sort of thing. And that was very valuable. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's kind of uh, startling how even just a little bit of simple planning and like Gantt charting and stuff like that 
can help you get where you want to go on yeah. something and gives you a way to monitor your progress against a plan. And so I took that away from uh, Boeing. But one of the things that helped push me away from Boeing was that uh, the sort of reward you get for performing there is a little different. I'm sure if I'd been willing to stick with it, it would have been, uh, could have been wonderful. But it wasn't quite right for me because in the time I was there, I felt like I was doing a good job and uh, everybody said I was. But then a coworker who hired in at the same time who would uh, come to work half stoned and sleep at his desk through lunch and all that kind yeah. of stuff would get the same raise as I would. <laughs> and uh, on top of it, because I'd you know, done okay with my projects, they would uh, take ones that were struggling and in some trouble and my reward for doing okay was to get the really gnarly stuff. And so uh, I'm, I'm sure that I could have progressed through the company and uh, had a nice career. A lot of people do. And my wife stayed with Boeing for many, many years. Okay. And uh, so I, I'm not here to throw rocks at Boeing because it's been a good company. Yeah. And uh, it gave me a good start for sure. Yeah. So then <clears throat> um, did you meet your wife at Boeing? I did. Okay. Yep. First date was going skiing. Yep. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. And then you guys got married, and then, um, so the, were you guys, um, did you get married during your time at Boeing then? No, uh, I, I left the company and went to a smaller company in Seattle as a project engineer, sort of like a project manager, mm -hmm. uh, and it, uh, we got married while I was there. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And then <clears throat> how, how did you like that in comparative to what you were doing with Boeing? I liked it a lot. Uh, my timing wasn't exactly wonderful. They were in a, a strong growth phase at that point, and uh, they had hired a general manager who in turn hired me. Okay. And I enjoyed the work a great deal, uh, but <clears throat> that was right before uh, the early 80s and the contraction that came in the uh, <clears throat> beginning of the Reagan era. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, that those were some tough times, and for a company that had sort of aggressively grown, it was especially tough because they were stretched already when all of a sudden that contraction happened. So oh, okay. They uh, when my boss who hired me got laid off, I thought, oh, this is not good. <laughs> and my wife was pregnant with our first child, oh. and so I went to a uh, her workplace lunch, sort of honoring her as she's about to. Uh, take a pregnancy or maternity leave yeah and i got to inform her at that uh going away lunch oh, that uh, no. i had just been laid off <laughs> oh no but we made it through fine and uh but it was uh it was interesting for sure yeah okay so then after leaving that company um where'd you go from there i actually started my own sort of project management business uh doing contracting for boeing in the navy usually on mechanical uh, assemblies that involved multiple processes, steel fabrication, machining, painting, finishing, that kind of stuff. Okay. And, uh, and it was uh, good and interesting. And then when uh, personal computing actually started to be a real thing, I was quite interested in it. And I, I did dabble a little bit in some small business software development. Okay. And... Uh, of all things on a DBase platform. Uh, nobody hardly now even knows what DBase is, but it was a database uh, that had a compilable programming language. Okay. And uh, so it could run reasonably fast mm -hmm. uh, as compared with, you know, some sort of elaborate macro system in uh, what then was Lotus 123, which was the hot spreadsheet as opposed to Excel. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But I, so I shifted a little bit more into technology. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And was that all within that your company that you had started or did you branch off and start? Well, I, I actually, uh, yes, initially, but then I uh, ceased operations in that company and created one that was really uh, oriented toward technology, which uh, was virtual stream. And I, I wound up launching into web design and all that sort of stuff as the internet came on and that was really my last uh sort of standard career as opposed to the work i do up here now yeah yeah okay yeah wow that's very cool so then um <clears throat> was taking that leap from after you got laid off um 
Did you start looking at other jobs, or did were you kind of certain, like, okay, I've learned enough, I want to start something on my own? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> I didn't have, like, a powerful feeling like, oh, I can just launch some new venture. But the, uh, the guy who hired me, that general manager who was laid off before I was, he's a very sharp guy with a lot of connections uh, from prior work, and he quickly was able to establish a bit of a consulting practice of his own, and he asked me to do work for uh, some of his projects, which gave me sort of a kickstart okay. in that department. That's that's what led me to feel like this is at least worth trying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Very cool. So then um, once you were done, so did, how did that kind of transition from the um, web design and all that stuff into uh, Christopherson Farm? Well, uh, <clears throat> I a lot of years have uh, gone by since that all that stuff, and uh, I'm at the age now, and thankfully, you know, our finances are such that I can focus my efforts a little bit more on the things I think are most important, as opposed. I'm sort of retirement age now, anyway, mm -hmm. and uh, so I do work full time over there, and I draw a modest salary, but. Uh, I'm pleased that I can work on that because it's something I truly care about. Yeah. And that's that's why I'm there is because I want to see the right stuff happen there. Yeah. So then um, was that – was anything going on there during that, like prior to you jumping ship and, and moving over there? Or what uh, was the state of Christopherson Farm when you jumped, joined back in? Well, uh, I had at least modest involvement sort of in my off time helping our mom uh, who for many years – Interesting. Uh, my, I think I mentioned to you that my great grandfather died at age fifty-seven, just two years after purchasing the farm. Okay. Yeah. And uh, my <clears throat> dad, his grandson, very much looked forward to retiring at Camino on the farm, and uh, his father, my grandfather, had already given him uh, the majority of that property. Okay. And uh, he was doing work in the fields and feeding the beef cattle and all that kind of stuff and really loving it. Uh, but he also died young at age 57. And so <clears throat> my mom really was uh, a sharp, creative thinker. Mm -hmm. And she just left us this past Easter at <clears throat> age 95, uh, really had a wonderful life. and uh, But she was able to come up with a plan for leasing the property uh, the agricultural property to other farmers or uh, ranchers. And okay. so we had a few different tenants over time. Uh, perhaps the most notable to island residents uh, would be the alpaca farmers. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, the alpacas really captured the hearts of uh, local folks because we often will hear people, they'll either refer to the farm as the alpaca farm yep. or they'll say, I still miss the alpacas. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they were fun to see there all the time. Uh, <clears throat> but that is how my mom was able to sort of make it work by herself. Wow. Uh, because that's a lot of <clears throat> property buildings, fences, roads, and all that sort of stuff to try and maintain. We're, right. We know that now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she did a great job of keeping the wheels on the place by doing that. Yeah, well, that's that's very cool. I was wondering if it was actually you guys that did the alpacas, but it sounds like it was a tenant then. That's correct. Okay. That's correct, yeah. And they're, they're just uh, farther east on the island now. Those okay. alpacas you see uh, on the flats when you're just coming onto the island yep. down south of the <clears> road, <throat> those are their, their alpacas. Oh, got it. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Um, okay. So then... Um, then where did you guys get started? How did you guys kind of come up with this? What were um, – because now you have uh, one of your siblings working with you, right? Yeah, and, you know, in at varying uh, – to varying degrees, all four of uh, us – all five of us are involved. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> we all five sit on the board of the farm and on the uh, the Zipline Tour Board. And, okay. And uh, my one sister, Mona, and I uh, run the Canopy Tour business for okay. sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So then, um, when you jumped into this then, what was kind of your vision for Christopherson Farm? Well, that has been sort of an evolving thing. We got involved, uh, my mom, uh, again, 
to her uh, enduring credit, had uh, established a limited liability company to progressively transfer the farm over to us over a long period of time so it could avoid a, a big tax burden or yeah. something like that. And <clears throat> the time came when we started uh, really running the operation ourselves, which is probably now uh, between 15 and 20 years ago. Okay. And uh, the, the alpaca folks uh, were on the property, and they had come uh, about eight years before, and they came as a couple with 300 animals, and their herd had grown to over 600 and uh, they, while they were staying in that 800 square foot cottage, they had triplets. Oh my word! And suddenly, uh, <laughs> they were kind of bursting at the seams. <laughs> and the uh, the good thing is their business was very successful, and it allowed them to buy that nice place further east on the island. Very cool. Yeah. And so uh, we got to a point for a lease renewal, and uh, we talked to them, and you know the relationship was good, and we just tried to understand what their pl plans were because they continued to operate our place after they themselves had moved because of their growing family. Okay. Uh, but it was also not the most convenient setup for them then. Right. And so we kind of uh, agreed that we would do different things. And uh, so it was at that time that we were kind of <clears throat> trying to understand, well, we have a lot of uh, property and buildings and roads to maintain, we need to have uh, a clear vision for uh, a financially sustainable operation here. So that is going to have to mean uh, doing some sort of business which generates revenue. Yeah. And we were in the process of trying to refine uh, from multiple choices uh, what we might do. And at that time, uh, my sister and her husband went to a conference at Whistler and one of the things, sort of side activities they could select from for this conference was to go zip lining at Whistler. Okay. Whistler and, uh, I think Whistler and the one on uh, Haleakala on Maui were the first two in North America. Well, I don't know if, yeah, is Hawaii North America? I, it, it must yeah. be. Yeah, it has to be. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> the first two in North America. And uh, okay. they... My sister and her husband are very different people from each other, but they both were super excited about their experience. And uh, my sister then, on a trip with her sisters and her mom over to Maui, uh, persuaded the other sisters <laughs> to try zip lining over there because there was one there. Yeah. And <clears throat> uh, again, different folks, but they all were really excited about it. It got us thinking a little bit because the. Uh, <clears throat> real obstacle to doing something like that would to be access to a suitable piece of property. Right. And we have uh, a big piece of property with a lot of different terrain features. And it, we started wondering, well, would we be able to find a suitable course on our property to do something like this? Yeah. And uh, it seemed like at each step <clears throat> of the way, as we looked at it, the reasons for trying it grew stronger. Yeah, And so we did wind up hiring uh, consultants who operated by that time uh, another very early tour in the uh, United States, one out of Alaska. They came down to look at uh, our site and evaluate the Seattle, greater Seattle marketplace and that kind of thing. Yeah, And they, they felt like we had a strong story to sell around this and that it was a good idea. And so it was in, I believe, uh, uh, early... 2008 that uh or no excuse me 2009 okay when we sort of made the decision we're gonna try this wow yep and so it was two years then of uh planning uh designing building getting it all set uh and then we opened in uh 2011 okay yeah so what were people's general reaction when you told them that that's what you guys were planning to do you know, we didn't uh, make a lot of fanfare that that's what we were doing. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, we wanted to get closer to it being a real thing mm -hmm. on the ground and about to work before we wanted to share a lot of that with the world. Yeah. Uh, and people have been routinely surprised. They say, wow, how did you come around to doing that? Uh, 
And it was really only through the experience, experiences of my sisters uh, that we even considered it. Yeah. Because we were looking at some other things like possibly a corporate retreat center or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, and those aren't bad ideas, and they aren't ruled out for the future, certainly, but uh, this was one that really aligned well with our mission. Uh, our mission at Christofferson Farm is Christofferson Farm uh, celebrates family, honors heritage, and respects the land. And <clears throat> so we wanted to do something that was light on the land, uh, that uh, didn't destroy what had been going on there, allowed us to continue to uh, pursue historic practices, yeah, and also uh, respected the land in sort of a different way in that we could bring guests in to show yeah. them the forest, show them sustainable methods that we're trying to use uh, to do our business. Yeah. So. No, that's that's awesome, and I think <clears throat> it's such a neat. I mean, it's a it's a the concept, and then the fact that it's you guys have built it and it's continued to be successful is such a like neat business because it's so not what anyone would have expected, right? Um, you know, <laughs> and especially like if you have a lot of land on the on Camino, which is obviously land is limited on an island. You can't just sure. keep extending it. Um, you know, I think a retreat center or something like that would be the first thought that would come to my mind is like, okay, we've got land, you can build, you can, yep. um, but to run something like this where, it, it, again, it just enhances the experience of Kameno um, is just such a neat concept. And we just love the, the Canopy Tours for, for all that that does on that side. Well, it is, that is nice. We have, uh, as you know, Brandon, on the island, there's, uh, we have a diverse population, but a big component of that population is retirees and people who are a little uh, of an older generation. And they have family members come and visit them. And there aren't a lot of things that they can say, oh, let's go do this here on Kamena or let's go do that. You can go to the park. If you're a golfer, you can go golf. And so uh, many of them have expressed real appreciation to us for uh <clears throat> bringing this activity that their guests can find entertaining and guests of all age can. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's neat. I still haven't gone out there. I think this summer we're, we're planning, we'll have to plan. I think you better do it. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, so then apart from just canopy tours Northwest though, you also have, um, dinners and things like that. How did you guys get started in that? Well, the, uh, canopy tour business has been great for the farm it's allowed us to take care of some needed maintenance things and provide sort of the financial fuel for that but we also feel like the farm itself is uh, a beautiful interesting place that we want to share with people and we are trying to sort of build that out a little bit the dinners in the barn are one piece of that yeah. and <clears throat> As you know, and uh, as the marketplace has supported, uh, we do a fall festival now yeah. uh, to raise funds for uh, local charities. And it's another way that we can bring people in to uh, experience the farm. We've <clears throat> also developed, <clears throat> we call it Terra Teams, which is a low challenge course okay. for corporate team building yep. that we're just starting to market now. It's uh, in a different spot on the property. And it's it's a fun exercise. Our uh, Staff people led some of our own <clears throat> internal folks through this, and I was one of them. Okay. And uh, sometimes if there's one person who wants to step in and control too much stuff, they'll put a blindfold on them so they have to uh, <laughs> have to rely on the others on the team Yeah. to take the lead yeah. and uh, depend on those people and look to them for that. And as you might suspect, I wound up wearing a blindfold. <laughs> Oh, very cool. That's that's neat, though. Again, it's just adding more to that experience of yeah. what you guys are offering yeah. there. Bit um, by bit, we're trying to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it's it's neat, and it's it's neat to see the evolution of that. Um, again, just to, like because as a Boy Scout, um, when I was younger, we went and visited the alpaca farm. And, yeah. Um, and then you know, I went off to college and stuff. Came back, and they're like, "Oh, did you know that Camino has a zip line?" Yeah. And, you know, I was like. Where? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where do we have that? So, um, yeah, no, it's really neat. Um, so then <clears throat> what do you see as the future of Christoph- Christopherson Farms? Well, what our goal is, uh, Brandon, is really to just uh, 
continue doing a lot of what we have done, expand some. We'll probably do some uh, modification of crops that we grow. Mm -hmm. We might wind up with some livestock on there a little bit. Uh, but more than anything, we want to continue sort of some historic practices, but do so in a way that's really sustainable, Yeah, uh, where we can share how that can work with others and uh, be part of sort of a collaborative process of learning how to do this stuff right. Yeah. And uh, we like the idea of being able to share uh, what we would do with others, share our property and the island with other people because it is a fantastic place and I still think in many ways it remains undiscovered yeah yeah for sure even though that um more and more people are learning about it yeah. it still is a lot of people if you go outside of this area yeah you talk about Camino Island they they're asking what <laughs> yeah where's that yeah yeah so so that's the idea is just to uh you know add on some things to what we're doing already, but not uh, any wholesale changes. Yeah. Mainly sort of improve and extend, <clears throat> if you will. Yeah. No, that's great. All right. Well, I'd like to end every podcast with some rapid fire questions. Okay. Hit uh, me. So, so the first one is, uh, do you have a lesser known or favorite location on Camino Island that you like to visit? Wow. That's a, that's a good question. And I don't uh, want to sound like I'm punting on this question at all, uh, even though it may sound a little bit like that. Our place is big, and I've, by the nature of some of these initiatives that I'm pursuing now, I don't even get to experience our own property in the same way that I used to. Yeah. And so some of the favorite places that I want to hang out on are different places on the property that are more recreational for me, like fishing in the lake and walking in the woods sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think that Camino is blessed to have still some really beautiful beach fronts. Uh, yep. The parks uh, are fabulous, I think. And uh, and that's being added to, like with the uh, Barnum Point uh, project yeah. and all that. And I think that's terrific. Uh, so I would list those high uh, yeah. on my... Yeah, and I think that's something that <clears throat> Camino just has, uh, especially you living in Seattle. You, it's more, you're probably more aware of it, that you find those pockets on Camino where you can step into the woods and listen and you can't hear cars. It's quiet. You just hear nature. And it's just, they're so, it's so relaxing. Like you don't get that very much in life. Um, yeah. as you get going. It's true. Yeah. Just wait another 10 years and we will continue to learn all the, uh, demonstrable medicinal benefits of being out in the woods. Yeah. It's yeah. already happening. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, pretend you have a friend from coming coming to Camino from out of town. What would their first day look like here? Well, uh, consistent with my last answer, I would say that we would spend a lot of time on our place <clears throat> because uh, one thing that I may not have uh, shared before is we really have a lot of diversity within that place. Mm -hmm. We've got wetlands, uh, a beaver marsh, <laughs> a lake. We've got hills, forest, uh, agricultural land. All, a lot of different things going on. So we would spend a good portion of the day there. We might run over to uh, Arrowhead Axe and do a little axe throwing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'm pleased that we now have a few more uh, eateries and watering holes uh, right here on Camino because yeah. it for many years there was almost nothing. Right. And so you can go and have multiple choices for a good burger or something even better. Yeah. And uh, you can get a beer. So there's a lot of opportunities. And uh, in addition to doing the parks and all that kind of stuff, I'd right. probably try and give them a quick tour of the, the whole island yeah. to get a feel for that. Right. But not tons of time, uh, quite a bit of time on the farm, and then uh, maybe one other spot, and then food and drink. Yeah. Very nice. Um <clears throat> Who is an interesting or fascinating person in this community that I should interview next? Ooh, I don't know whom you have interviewed. Uh, well, you can throw out names and I'll tell you. <laughs> all right. Uh, there are a lot of them, I think. Uh, and I enjoy a lot of people up here. Uh, and I'm still learning who they are. I don't know if you've uh, talked with Randy. Uh, mm -hmm. Randy and Marla Hegel. Yeah. Uh, they are big community boosters, and uh, they're thinking creatively about new things that they can develop. I work some with uh, 
uh, Renee Kettler, who's the uh, Remax person yeah. here, and a real solid community booster also. I don't know if you've talked to her. Uh, and then there are, there are other, you know, I think that it would be an interesting story to learn about the alpaca people. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Karen Byram and Ugo Loa and what their experience has been because they brought those animals first from uh, Chile in South America okay, up to upstate New York in uh, a chartered jet and wow. they had to be quarantined I think for a year down there before coming up okay. to upstate New York and then quarantined maybe for another month and then trucked across the country. So they took a long <laughs> trek to get their business <clears throat> and their animals here. Yeah. And uh, it's quite a story. <clears throat> and they've, they've sold them all over the world, I think. Wow. Uh, it's a different business now, I think, because they were early adopters. But okay. But I think they would be interesting. And, you know, I will take it as my assignment to come up with a couple other good names for you. Very cool. Yep. Yeah. No, I would love to interview them. They would... Yep. Um, like like you've mentioned already, like they've been a lot of the islanders know who they are. Even if they don't know them, they know the That's alpacas. right. They made an impact for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um okay, lastly, if you could have a message on a billboard on Camano Island, right as you're driving up the hill there, what would that say? I might say something like, Let's work together and get something cool done. Very good. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. My pleasure, Brendan. It was fun. All right. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Chris Christopherson for joining me on the podcast today. And thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. And for more information on this episode or previous episode, go to KaminoCommons.com slash podcast. That's KaminoCommons.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening and see you next time.